important session on leveraging green and agri-tech finance for inclusive business, through which we would like to explore the opportunities that this type of financing gives for inclusive business. I have the pleasure to invite the panelists and moderator of this session to take a seat at the stage. This session will be introduced and moderated by Mr. Himendra Mathur, Venture Partner, Bharat Innovation Fund. I would now like to invite Himendra to start the session. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I think we are running a bit late, uh, so we won't spend too much time on introduction. But thanks for joining us for this panel. A very, very interesting topic, leveraging green and agri-tech finance for inclusive business. And a fantastic panel on the dais. Uh, I don't think they need any introduction, but very briefly, uh, Emmanuel Mure uh, is a director with uh, <coughs> Caspian, investment director with Caspian, uh, has tons of experience in agri-tech, mentors, a few hundred startups, but a very, very fatherly figure for a lot of startups, I must say. Uh, then uh, we are joined by Mr. Dinesh Malik. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he's the owner of Azad Agro Enterprise, so welcome Dinesh. Uh, Sharath from Ninja Kart, I think everyone knows Ninja Kart, one of the most scaled up agri tech startup. Uh, started as a marketplace, now playing a very interesting role across the food supply chain. And last but not the least, my friend Vijay, uh, he's incubated a lot of startups, now the CEO of Egg Hub. And then fantastic job supporting a lot of startups from early stage. The one who raised a lot of money now are essentially his babies, if I can say so. <laughs> so great, uh, thanks for joining. Uh, it's an interesting topic. Uh, just to set the context, uh, uh, we are hearing a lot about green finance of late, which is a good sign given the challenges that we see uh, on climate. Delhi weather is a testimony to all the people who have come from outside Delhi. It's a, and it is becoming challenging for farmers for sure. I think uh, everyone is bearing the, uh, I would say, everyone is seeing the challenges, but I think the person who share the disproportionate risk of climate changes is the farmer, especially is the the farmer. And I think there is definitely need for a lot of innovation uh, and a lot of innovative financial products which can uh, sort of, I would say help farmers to adopt sustainable practices. I think that's where the opportunity is. And that's where startups, financiers, bankers, regulators, philanthropists, everything, everyone has to come together uh, to build, start building products on these lines. Uh, so, so that's what we're going to discuss as part of the panel. Maybe I can start with Emmanuel first. Emmanuel, uh, we all know Caspian uh, has done different type of financial instruments, uh, equity, debt, blended finance. Uh, I think especially when it comes to green financing, or inclusive financing, you know, what is Caspian's thesis and what products we wear, you can give some guidance on that. We are uh, very early into this green finance. So really, uh, products have to be developed appropriately for the needs of the country and uh, raise funds also to match that kind of need. And uh, a large number of uh, startups are trying to uh, work towards solutions uh, in this space. And even that is largely work in progress. So what already they do may have an element of green. But to really focus on the green side and then bring that as the highlight of their program uh, requires a relook as well. And uh, from a funding perspective, what we see is uh, these solutions have to be very scalable on the ground. <coughs> so the good old uh, ag tech having a technology piece. Uh, trying to do something like this may not work. It requires close collaboration with communities and institutions on the ground, uh, which is going to be the new side of things. It also requires uh, contiguous areas to be worked upon. So you can't do random 
work with a few farmers here and there. The whole area requires to be treated uh, if we want to really have a benefit of this kind of a, a green impact on uh, reducing carbon or the other kinds of climate change issues. And these also need collaboration because uh, some of these would require infrastructure, some of these lands belong to the government and unless they also participate in this, a mere private capital trying to do this will not work. Uh, the other thing is about uh, how long it takes to do it. So the typical uh, VC kind of money has a very short window. It expects returns in a quick uh, period and somebody to, you know, buy you out at a certain time horizon. Uh, in programs of this nature, it will take a few years even to show a positive impact. And the cost of doing this also will be significant and the upsides of it have a large degree of externalities. So whoever is actually implementing it may not be the beneficiary of everything that happens. And these may, uh, to the society at large, to the community, the benefits may come. So how do we monetize those is also to be discovered. So it's a large amount of work in progress. Uh, many people interested in this, funders also. But I think uh, before we actually take the money and commit to do something, uh, we ourselves in the, are in the process of discovery. Mm. No, absolutely, I think mm. everyone is figuring it out. Even I see when Agritech started, I think climate tech was not even on the horizon. Thankfully, at least in the last three, four years, I see climate tech becoming more integral uh, to a lot of Agritech uh, interventions that we see in India. Um, so with that, maybe we can go to uh, Dinesh. Dinesh, uh, you work very closely with farmers and I think you do capacity development, training programs for farmers. Can you bring a farmer perspective to sustainability, you know, given the fact that farmers are small, I don't know whether they can afford a lot of innovations around climate. Are, are they really worried about water table? Are they really worried about sort of climate change that, that's are happening? How it is impacting them? And are they willing to change and adopt? Uh, thanks, thanks for uh, inviting me and to give me opportunity for talking in this panel. Uh, there is a very burning issue in nowadays in uh, our agriculture sector, and uh, especially small farmers, they are not aware about any uh, any kind of this uh, green technology or like uh, awareness in this sector. And uh, farmer, they are doing as per their. Uh, commercial things, they need to be develop their uh, commercial values on their crops. They don't want to be put their money or efforts without any benefits. So on that case, government and other private sector, they are trying to help it out. But individually, they are uh, not ready to take all this process or all this, uh, uh, all this uh, implementation in their field. Because of that, that is very uh, unusual or it is uh, very uh, un uh, profitable things for farmers. So we need to be provide trainings to farmers on small scale farmers. It is a very uh, compulsory in all this sector because this tables burning is a burning issue in the nowadays. And uh, I just uh, went to all this field and found that what is the cause of that. A lot of farmers, they want to be they don't want to be burned actually but they have no option they told ki you just take it all these staples from our uh, field at free of cost we are ready to give but same time our infrastructure our uh, all this uh, implements equipments is not up to their uh, going their field and take that material from there and process that same things for industry purpose a lot of uh, uh, private sector they are working on that and we also tried for that but challenge is the ultimately uh, the one uh, question from came from last session they told ki uh, we are ready to buy that uh, stables from uh, all this field level and 
try to make a fuel and other products for uh, utilizing in industries. But at the same time, uh, farmer don't know where they sell it. But there is a little bit gap, and uh, I think there is a very uh, focused uh, issue on that. Ki we are working on that and make a one this training and other than some institute they are try to work on that on basically basically on that only and same time uh, this agriculture sector like uh, icr they are developing some decomposer for this all this uh, for making fertilizer or compost on their field but that was also not uh, very successful i i don't know but my point of view that was also not successful projects for farmers because the cost is very high cost is going very high after that uh, and using decompose or converting in compost so small scale farmers they need to be training and need to be market first we give the some good uh, implements or technology wise uh, or some good private players entering on that and basically they are working in ppp mode and in this sector that is the perfect because buyer and seller both are ready but this gap is only the uh, their procedure or their completely that uh, fulfill their requirements. Thank you. I think since you are talking about cost, maybe a quick follow-up question. You are saying cost is high, mm. right? Um, I know cost of collection is also prohibitive for a lot of business models which are based on stubbles. But if you look at the cost of the health risk for Delhi and CIs, it's a huge and I'm farmers also are at health risk. It's not that they are not uh, subject to this uh, bad air. So I don't know, if there is one policy intervention that is needed, whether it's financial commitment from the government or what, what should be that which can essentially uh, change the scenario for the forward. This is a very uh, good question. Okay, everybody is caring about health or this is the very uh, um, not cost wise it's very uh, it's life things of our community or society but same time farmer is not aware about that farmer they work on their field they don't know how to be they spoil or how to be they damage their health and improve that things so trainings or that uh, some demonstration is must on that we show that things uh, just like uh, any doctor shows that what is the effect of smoking, what is the effect of that, uh, any other um, high unhygienic foods. So they displayed that things, they give that some demonstration, they give the trainings to farm a person and they show that mean uh, same time they are uh, giving the some ads on that. So this is the part of uh, like uh, awareness. First part of it is, uh, is awareness and uh, second is you have to show that because uh, after that seeing that everything in their front of any demonstration field, they feel it. Okay, this is the and uh, give the some in her government of Haryana, they give the some uh, I think funds or subsidy on that also. Okay, they are not burning that and uh, same time they are uh, in, uh, putting some fun, uh, fine on that if they are burning that. But we give the some training programs and awareness and some private sector will be involved in that because implementation agencies always be work for uh, 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 any uh, government sector but if it's efficiently they are working because they are they, they are on field and they are working for uh, both of them they channelize it so industry participation training demonstration you think can change things okay that's good to hear with that go to charat of course first tell us about ninja cart i think especially post Flipkart investment and then Walmart connection. Uh, I think Ninja Cart has seen a transformation. And so it will be good to understand the startup journey. Started as a marketplace, but now working with multiple <coughs> stakeholders. Uh, and also if you can also talk about your farmer engagement and anything you are doing on the sustainability side with farmers. Sure, yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll divide it into uh, three questions, right? So, okay, first, uh, why transform? Second, okay, how that has have been helping every stakeholder touch upon even the inclusive finance part of it. And finally, okay, uh, the sustainability part of it, right? So, <coughs> first thing, right? So, the first uh, half of a journey when we were doing our fulfillment business that we just were telling, hey, I'm gonna 
uh, remove all the middlemen, I'm going to buy from farmers directly and then distribute to retailers, right? So uh, we are bullish about it. It was a very good idea. It was an idea which, which was easily accepted, right? But then as we uh, had this journey, right, uh, we felt uh, every uh, every layer or the middlemen, right, they were value adding, uh, value adding was happening, value add was happening for each guys and then they were pushing for the supply chain to work. Right, and as we progress further, okay, uh, then it, it it doesn't make sense to just remove them because there are there there are there for for specific reasons. It's so easy to just form a story that uh, you know just remove middlemen and then have direct taxes makes sense. No, it doesn't make sense because you need to have at certain level aggregators. You need to have certain level uh, the risk takers, the investors in between who can trade the uh, inventory because everybody wants cash today uh, and uh, everybody wants to sell off the inventory today, right? But then there needs to be certain credit infused within the supply chain for people to accept. People want to see the product before they buy. Uh, people will not want to risk their uh, goods before getting the money. It, it's both ways, right? So, with this sudden uh, financial complexities, we 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 could appreciate uh, each of uh, the individual uh, layers. Say uh, we call it farmer, source trader, destination trader, uh, Kirana, and then uh, from destination also enterprise and uh, <coughs> importers, exporters, like right. So at every leg, we felt there were uh, cleanups to be done. Where you know, uh, and one more story that now, hey, uh, if you talk generally to a a, a trader. They say, hey, I do not want my son to get into this business. Or any farmer says, hey, I do not want my son or daughter to get into this business. Right? It, is not, it is not more, it is not a business that they are really proud of. But then, then that means uh, it needs a certain infusion of tech, information, streamlining, uh, that it, you know, it, it creates a better life for them, right? And we, we really understood and then we moved away from that storyline and then we got into a high, how collab would work. And that's where this whole, partnership model where, hey, let me, I have the tech, I have the logic, uh, I, I might not be a category uh, a player for each and every category across horticulture and say veg and food, right? But then uh, the math and the algorithm is the same. Let me bring tech, let me bring information, let me help you get access. Uh, let me get you uh, credit the right time and, and work with you. And, and that's what you see where we have uh, Ninja Kisan, we have Ninja Mandi, which uh, works between the source trader and the destination trader, uh, a marketplace which enables them to trade in, in a much more secure way. Uh, Ninja Kirana, which helps a Kirana uh, get uh, fresh produce, also staples from the local Mandi, right? And then uh, Ninja Global, yes, which is trying to enable a cross-border platform, uh, helping uh, India also export to other countries. And also, India is a, a big market, right? So, uh, and especially of, of fruits, if you should say, right? Uh, 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 it, it, I think I don't think it has been democratized yet. The distribution is so huge. It's a large country. Every pocket eats apple. But then, if you, if you talk about who is importing uh, uh, fruits, it, it's, it's, it's very few players. Uh, and uh, not, is every exporter around the world very happy with uh, working with those importers? No, it's, it's, it's a hard twist, right? Hey, uh, it's okay to work with this person because he's giving me a 200 container, 300 container order, uh, right? But then he, because he's giving the volume, uh, you know, the, the price is reduced, but then that doesn't really percolate into price because he holds uh, the distributions uh, thing, right? So how can we get uh, better access to Indian uh, market is also something that cross border is working on. So this is how we are trying to, and when we work on this, definitely uh, it's not only about uh, making this, uh, this cannot be made efficient without making, removing the bad players because the, the barrier of entry is very less in each of these legs. Today, I, uh, nobody is going to ask me any question uh, if I say, hey, I want to start a food shop or a trading period, right? But then if I say I have to, hey, I'm going to start a petroleum refinery, I'm going to have a lot of questions because the entry barrier is less, everybody enters it, but then this needs a lot of, mm, uh, a risk has to be, Sense. So how can we bring the right people? How can we uh, put off the wrong players? Is also something which 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 with which with the data layer helps. Uh, so that's what we are trying to work, and that's how our transformation is helping each leg of the uh, player. And to touch upon, uh, so basically market access, information asymmetry, uh, right time credit, uh, uh, right time finance to the trade. Uh, uh, how can I secure a trade in terms of quality? How can I secure payments to a buyer and the seller, right? Is this something that, uh, is this what, what is happening across the marketplaces that we have created? The last part, which is your sustainability part, sustainability part, wherein we work with the farmers. See, uh, that is a place that we are right now uh, uh, putting a lot of efforts in trying to understand, hey, uh, uh, well, there is a lead time between the, where he works and it translates into money. Uh, second, there are a lot of, uh, we have had a lot of, uh, uh, inputs in terms of inputs, that is 
good amount of seeds, it's good amount of uh, fertilizers, and uh, a lot of options available, both legal and illegal. There are a lot of uh, chemicals available, which is off the market, not off the market, right? So uh, we are trying to understand, hey, uh, how does uh, the demography category, you know, the choices of uh, uh, farmers uh, <laughs> depends on what he trades and who he trades with, why he trades with. And we are trying to figure out, and then one small thing we could uh, initially start work was, uh, hey, uh, I'm going to tie up with a few uh, retailers who only sell those fertilizers, I think, which are kind of good and which has good results. And I'm going to offer, work along with a bank and then offer them a simple credit where, they, where the end use case is sealed, where they can only use it for the right uh, input is what we have been pro we piloted and it, it's, it's showing results. Uh, the, the end use case is tied, so there is no the money is used for the right purposes. Uh, they're also uh, their output is increasing, etc. Is there, but then yeah, uh, we are still uh, kind of figuring out uh, the, to understand the more of the life cycle of the farmer rather than just the business, right? To uh, where and all what inputs needed for him to take the right decisions uh, is, is 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 work in progress as rightfully even himself. It's very interesting you talking about co-lab model. I think this is a good term. Very rarely used by a lot of startups. Every startup believes they can build everything on their own. And I think it's more of an investor question, but I'm tempted to ask it. You know, I came from private equity into venture capital. Still feel an odd man out here. The term which we used to focus on, ROC, return <coughs> capital employed. Come into VC space, the terms you hear, GMV, GTV, CAC, all kind of abbreviation, but ROC is probably not used as <laughs> frequently as probably it should. So if you are building something on your own versus building together <coughs> the ecosystem, how does capital efficiency work? What What is, I'm sure there'll be a lot of startups sitting in the room. What is a good way to utilize the capital? And how do you decide what you should build and what sh you should partner on? Oh. <laughs> I, I'll try to answer it, I think. Uh, because see, uh, it, it, it's just a conscious call. I would say that, right? I, uh, should I be the should I be jack of all masters, or should I hold something very critical what I hand and work with partners who are really good in what they claim to do, right? So, and and then uh, those partnerships really work because every partnership is more of a headache than passing off uh, the work, right? Not every outsourcing works, not every vendor works, right? It's it's like hey, let me do it. I don't want this headache. Is a lot of time we take a decision call. Uh, in that way, uh, a lot of trial and errors kicks in place. And secondly, uh, the most important thing is that, hey, whether we are aligned to this objective is, is one more equation, right? So wherein, uh, hey, and, and uh, we have to do some trials in terms of, hey, it's my capital, but then I'm gonna, you are my partner. And if you work this way, might be I park some fund with you and then we, we work together, right? So wherein our objectives are aligned, where, where a clear agreement is in place. And I think uh, in this, uh, space, uh, even I think uh, uh, it, it, it is it's it's a long way to go. But at least uh, we are seeing that you know uh, 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 more of in the logistic space, right? Uh, models are coming into place. We are all we also run few uh, 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 few warehouses in a in a in a, in a collaborative way. Uh, and especially I would I would want to talk where you know uh, we have taken our tech to another country, right? So uh, there's a startup where we have just put up tech stack. And they, for them, it was very easy to kind of hit the market and run, right? So, uh, and they, we, are, we are already seeing results in how they were able to kind of quickly reduce their dump. Uh, just by, within the three months of just talking and not even implementing anything, uh, you know, our, our tech has been able to be in uh, you. So, the tech, so when we talk about exports, it's not just products. I'm just taking one, I'm just uh, digressing from you, but then agri tech is also something which is we are building which can fit the world. But coming back to the point, right, uh, when it, in collab model, uh, uh, both the parties should, should have a clear cut objectives and uh, it cannot be like, you know, uh, winning over others' cost. If, if that objective is set right, uh, it, it really works. Great, that's very good to you, thanks. With that, I'll go to Vijay. Vijay, you've seen agri tech from the very beginning been incubating dozen startups to multiple organizations. What what are the changes do you see, you know, in terms of the quality start quality of startups and founders that you find? Um, we are in the so called funding winter. Um, do you see business models changing, pivoting? And especially in the context of the topic of the discussion is is sustainability, is climate tech, you know, are they 
Uh, do you see some good deal flow in that particular space? Thank you for the question and uh, first of all, thank you organizers for calling me here. So when we talk about agri-tech, yes, uh, for the last two decades, country has been talking about agri-tech. There are 100 odd agri-incubators, 3000 startups, which are actually trying to do a lot more agri-tech. And hence you see a lot of, you know, uh, the startups like these who are actually, you know, representing across the farm to fork ecosystem. But uh, as we talk about uh, the <coughs> numbers, I think I see some stagnation in terms of the number of startups. Uh, but yes, each of these startups, what I saw, have been growing and maturing in terms of either the quality of work, the clarity, and of course, the focus towards the business models, the sustainability, and also reach out to the farmers. Uh, early days of Agritech was all about uh, startups focusing more often on a B2B or B2G models. But eventually, I see a few of the startups uh, focusing on uh, the B2C models or B2F models, where they're focused towards the farming communities. The second dimension of it, when we talk about sustainability, uh, yes, in terms of sustainability, startups are definitely focusing on sustainability dimension. Uh, of course, the numbers and the percentage is very less. Uh, before I talk about that conclusion, <laughs> the last nine years of my agri-tech presence, I came across almost 2,500 startups, out of which I would largely say 97% of the startup founders are largely agri-tech focused. Now slowly those 2-3% of the startup founders are talking about sustainability dimension. Sometimes this sustainability dimension is direct, sometimes it is indirect. I'll give you a couple of examples. Like uh, before I talk about that, let me also talk about what we do at Agab. Agab is an incubation center funded by NABAR and Ministry of Food Processing Government of India. It's an incubation center housed in the Telangana Agriculture University in the state of uh, Telangana in Hyderabad. We do support technology companies through incubation, technology pilots, co-innovation. A uh, couple of examples as I mentioned, for example, co-innovation, which is India's first program what we designed is to curate the startup founders to build innovations with the agriculture scientists. So I have one example to quote where one startup founder which who is working on IOTs has been working with the entomologists in the university to build a unique IOT based pest analytics platform. And when he started working in the early days of the pest analytics platform, I thought, okay, this pest analytics platform is going to give us the amount of pest control measures and help farmers to mitigate the or manage the pest. But I also realized that the scientists got a very unique dimension. They said that, okay, this platform is also able to distinguish between the harmful pests and beneficial pests. So in agriculture point of view, you have to take care of the beneficial pests, which are also equally important for the biodiversity or uh, managing agriculture. So a lot of these things are not accounted in the typical agri-tech prism. So when you see in the sustainability prism, these things are really happening, number one. Number two, we also have examples of companies which are working on agro-photovoltaics, a startup called Rencube, which is funded by CIA and Jito Angels. And this company is talking about agro-photovoltaics. This is probably one of the very few agro-photovoltaics company which can be used in a live farm. As a farmer, I can do the farming and also parallelly I can harness solar energy. Under the Agritech Innovation Pilot Program, which is a technology validation platform of Agar, we have validated the technology for almost two seasons on the farm with the involvement of the scientists and the farmers. We have come to the conclusion that almost 30% of uh, extra crop and almost 100% of solar energy is harnessed from the live farm. So how, how it is important is most of the other solar energy uh, examples which are there are talking about harnessing solar energy in conventional buildings or wastelands but not in a live agriculture farm. So these kind of applications, the solar applications coming into agriculture is live examples of the founders thinking about sustainability applications in agriculture or the startup founders talking about biotechnological applications and using bios and slowly reduce the intervention of chemical pesticides and fertilizers involvement in agriculture. Of course, the presence of bio fertilizers and pesticides have been there for a long time, no doubt, but yes, there are also policy implications, challenges. But despite that, there have been startup founders who are trying to you know, create some sustainable dimensions through biotechnological approaches. On the other side, there are also startups which are also working on drone tech. You may imagine what does drone tech do in sustainability because we are literally looking in the agri-tech dimension. But in terms of the studies that the university scientists have done in Agherb, they have established that 30% of water and 30% of pesticide is saved by usage of drones in agriculture. So this is a very significant kind of a recognition that is coming, right? If I'm saving 30% water and 30% pesticide, it is definitely, you know, ensuring some kind of a customer's health and safety and of course, 
reduction of pesticides in agriculture so these are some sustainability dimensions or there are some startup which are working on food and sustainability right somebody is talking about let's say palm sugar you may wonder what is palm sugar going to do right maybe it is replacing sugar then when you are replacing sugar it eventually means you are reducing the dependency on sugar cane and everybody knows sugar cane is gulps lot of water isn't it so there are today's country is there is a very a uh, kind of a very challenging kind of a ecosystem right we are always putting the agri tech lens to it but there is a people who are talking about sustainability dimension so what i'm essentially trying to say is we are we have to establish the criticality or the connectivity between the agri tech and sustainability tech either in terms of the startup which are directly <laughs> focused in sustainability tech or there are currently some startup which are having some agri tech solutions we have to establish the sustainability dimension of it either way the second important factor is on the sustainability yes not only the startup founders although they are very few in number but enablers also are talking about it like we as an incubator are also having a special focus we not only look out for agri tech startups but we are also essentially looking out for sustainability tech or green tech companies which can actually change the fate of agriculture it needs some not only interventions which can solve immediate agriculture because most of the agri tech solutions right now are actually solving agriculture issues immediately which can actually solve maybe the current farming practices from farm to fork right how can you equip a farmer to bet, do a better farming through the intervention of technology but involvement of sustainability tech and climate tech are talking about the mid term or long term goals and that is where few of the startup founders are coming and not only the startup founders but the incubators and accelerators also coming into picture at least back doors i'm able to hear couple of accelerators and funds at least in india who are talking about launching climate tech accelerators or climate tech funds some kind of discussions are happening i hear from the ecosystem of course you may not see it happening but at the back end because we are on the enabling side people brainstorm with us for the last couple of months we've been discussing on those lines so definitely there's a seriousness on the startup at the base of pyramid and also the enabling ecosystem and of course the donors and the governments are talking about it and possibly because of which this forum exists and one important point i also like to say is when i talk about sustainability definitely there is some kind of cost and who will bear the cost is the question and that is where we are talking about involvement of you no know, uh, developmental organizations or non profits governments and eh, donors who can actually you know finance the climate tech i'll talk more about it but yeah this is the perspective sure no hey, that's a uh, i have a question for you and just you know deviating right but a lot of these tech that we create right it is inward looking is involved but then many of these solutions are uh, something which can uh, like can look global right uh, this the, I, i definitely do believe that uh, uh, people in africa people in say uh, brazil or say uh, even the south american countries right on the large scale <coughs> or who do large scale thing a certain of these things also uh, will we would have built a solution but then we don't have uh, say uh, an access so how many of those startups are as it, you're also from you're also having a bharat news fund right so can you see uh it, it going towards that direction where we solving for uh, text solve uh, we where we move away from they not being an uh, bpo of other countries and moving towards hey i am bringing tech which can also solve uh, you know, can you see certain startups going towards that direction yeah well, thanks for putting moderate on the spot <laughs> <laughs> no great uh, no i think you are right i i personally i believe that what we developing in india is uh, is applicable to lots of other countries uh, most of the innovation small world of focus and we have 120 million small world of farmers in india world would have 500 million and you will be surprised i'm part of few gro- global studies and some global investment funds that we keep doing this country thesis forget africa go to bangladesh go to pakistan go to sri lanka go to nepal go to bhutan hardly any agri tech southeast asia i think the number of startups in telangana will be more than the number of startups in whole of southeast asia and of course kenya tanzania they are so far i think that i think challenge is so first of all i would say it's probably too much to expect from an entrepreneur to start hitting other countries because it's not just taking innovation to other countries it's also the legal frameworks and the finding a local partner and stuff like that and i think there's an opportunity to create agri tech corridors but whether we like it not like it or not it either has to be a philanthropy effort so like so gates foundation for example or a government to government effort i don't know whether that's possible or even government is thinking about it but you have to build those you know 
the basic fundamental layers for even startups to think. Like India is a huge market, you know. You know, I said pan India agri tech doesn't exist and probably won't ever exist mm -hmm. because you know each. I'm working with few startups in UP. They are not even thinking beyond East UP. It, this is not enough for us, right? I work with S for S Technologies. Like in Aurangabad and doing 220 crore worth of business, one single cluster. So what is the incentive for startups to look beyond a state or a country? So I think there has to be some catalytic effort, but you're right. What innovation that we're developing, I think we'll lose out a big time if we don't start looking at that global opportunity. But it has to be uh, what Nescom did for IT in 80s or 90s. I think some something of that sort need to happen. Just to add, I think all the startups when we talk about innovation, they have uh, the metric and also the potential to scale and eventually be uh, an applicable for global ecosystems. Having said that, most of the startups are either in uh, not having a limitation of you know not being able to raise funds and be there, or they have been too busy in building the homegrown market. As simple as that. And agritech, what we talk is hardly a ten or fifteen year old ecosystem, right? Now. Mainstream agritech, what we really talk today is most of it have happened after the startup in initiative, so less than ten year, right? Apart from whatever happened before to. 15 they're already there all the mature starters are there like you guys so i think it, the starters are uh, being there in terms of building the ecosystem today being there and trying to create a local market and raising investments but yes i think in the next decade to come the starters will definitely you know be there yeah so a counter question um, <laughs> coming from this um, and this is work for Shad and dinesh uh, so i think what vijay talked about is very interesting the product based innovations you know be drones or photo welter would be happy to learn more about it. Uh, this setting here is developed uh, Pariksha for soil testing to the device which gives results instantly. Now, a lot of these product innovations need platforms for farmer access. Right? So, one is of course conventional NGO, FPO, root, etc. But what about startups like Ninja or you know your organization, you know, which have such <coughs> good farmer connect? Would you be open to take some of these innovations to farmers? With your platform, because I think that's where those product-centric startups may find it very difficult to do things on their own. I'll take this. Yeah. I'll take this. <coughs> so, Himra, we have. Okay. So, uh, we have something called a Zagnet mm -hmm. in with a Ninja Cart, right? Where, which is a framework of uh, we getting access, giving access to those products uh, or say services uh, which can give access to a farmers. It's a platform, right? This ag uh, this Zagnet is in place. Uh, we are talking to few startups to pilot it, but again, right? When you're when you want to initially, <laughs> hey, I'm putting my uh, product on this platform. I own the customer. You own the customer. That 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 is a struggle, right? Where where partnership is with Hey, I will do anything, but I will not let you own my customer, right? But then it's just one customer, right? So uh, the same person uses Google, Facebook. Netflix, so somewhere maybe you should understand that hey, it's a platform. Uh, what do you mean by really owning a customer when I mean, it comes to a startup's sense, right? It is something that we'll have to work on. But I think apart from that, uh, yes, we have built the framework. Uh, and as you said, right, not only uh, Eastern UP, right, as you said, the solution that they built, certain things would be very, very uh, specific to a, a core part. and. Uh, I think uh, yet we are not in that place that I can give such a, a very super focused uh, you know, access to only a particular area. I think uh, I think that is where the challenge. These are two. Essentially, the geography you are present. In. Yeah. Because you won't go to a new geography for somewhere else, but at least the geography you are present. No, if, if it makes sense, we will go. But then uh, to try it out, the initial stage is okay. Something where there is an intersection between okay, what my farmer wants and is there something that he can immediately use? Is something that. We're looking at, and uh, we are open for pilots, and, and uh, we are just spreading the word. So definitely yes. Thank you. Uh, right, uh, you are very right about that. We have to take some pilot projects of that, and uh, see that what is the benefit to we goes to farmer or and the other than our customer requirements, and uh, farmer want to be develop their uh, farming or their uh, productivity and uh, increase that sourcing of income at the uh, same time. And customer also need that safe product with uh, good technology with the farmers. But the main thing is we have to develop some cluster zone on that. I mm, believe on that key we have to give the some good example to other person and create some uh, story or create some things in, uh, in 
developing this sector. One sector we develop on that base of one story or one, one uh, cluster, we can develop on that. But then we can float on other area also. And that is a great potential in our country in remote areas. Because th that area is almost uh, uh, very near to nature. And they are very um, accessible for every, everything. They are not uh, insisting or they are not uh, denying anything for doing any work on that area. And we are, as a company, we pay that amount for, because that climatic and other part is very crucial in our uh, business also. Our customer is paying on that basis we are doing all this work. And especially in export, they are looking all these uh, aspects from our business. And they are funding, same time they are uh, giving some funding of CR, CSR also, providing the all the facilities to farmer. If we give the all these things to farmer in free of cost or minimum amount of that uh, charging maybe without uh, any benefit or cost to cost we are doing. But initially we start from the uh, some put uh, some our money from our pockets or from our customers. So then we can give the very good example or very good things to farmer and save that all these things and time mainly especially in labor, cost of labor and availability season time. That is very difficult in every area. And we give the some other work same time and develop their uh, livelihood or any other than their uh, daily income source. And they we develop them to develop their own things in their field and, and uh, instead of this uh, spraying or other things, products. So we just create one uh, uh, part of one our business part. Maybe we are uh, running business in four or five sector, but uh, we just select one area in our interior part and we just start try to be start because uh, that is the uh, effect will come from there only. So that is my point of view. We can sure. manage Thank it. You. Very useful. So, last question to Emmanuel before we open it up for Q&A. Uh, so, Emmanuel, you invest in Balwan, which is mechanization startup, Kiwi, agri fintech. What is your criteria when you are evaluating a startup? And in that hierarchy of criteria, how critical is impact on the ground? You know. So, if you can give some idea. Yeah. So, uh, we established this fund about uh, February of this year. Uh, it's not a very big fund, but uh, we believe we can make significant impact through whatever resources we have. Uh, the first investment we made was into a company called Balwan Krishi, uh, which is uh, selling affordable uh, farm implements targeted at small farmers uh, solving two problems one is of uh, labor cost another is of labor availability during peak agricultural operations so using these machinery the small farmer could do a large number of operations on her or his farm themselves rather than relying on labor or others. And uh, the two key elements of what we as Balwan are doing is durability of those machines, serviceability of these machines. So we ensure that these are not the typical Chinese made low cost work for a season kind of machine. So they're, they're going to last for two to three years, they're durable. Any problems, they can be serviced at a wide range of service centers close to the farmers. So we have kept spare parts and stores identified. The farmer can either go there or send the machine and it gets serviced over there in case of problems. And space, all movable parts of these machines have fixed lives. You need spares which fit those. So sometimes you buy a machine and uh, you see that there's no spares available once that uh, moving part is finished. So in this sense, we're trying to solve the problem of uh, labor as well as the problem of drudgery in agriculture. So these are the two things that company is doing exceedingly well after we injected capital. It's 
attracting interest from many. Uh, some of you should look it up and read more about it. And uh, the other investment we made, again, I think our fund thesis is around uh, are we impacting farmers? So by what we do, can we look and see what benefit has happened to end farmers? That's the question. So we're not looking at the other side. From the farm gate to the consumer side, we will not do any of these business unless it's able to trace back benefits to the farmers. So in Kiwi, what we are doing is to solve this kind of a riddle. And I think that tons of literature saying that 80% of small and far marginal farmers uh, do not still have access to formal uh, financial services uh, and uh, Kisan credit card, whatever, all the banking system still hasn't been able to uh, build financial solutions appropriate to the farming community. So that is what it, it is. Uh, we're in the early stages designing suitable products that solve the financial needs of small farmers in a manner that enhances their income is the mission that we are uh, doing this. Uh, extremely mission focused. Every investor on the table talks about not returns and other things. We are not even worried about uh, GMV or scale. We are very, very seriously impact focused of trying to resolve because there have been other players including Anil, my dear friend here. Uh, there are other uh, big players in the financial business. I'm also on the board of Napkisan, but we really have not uh, addressed farmer finance. We've always looked at some intermediary who absorbs the risk of credit and then we piggyback on him and try to say you take the risk and you do the lending and you do the last mile lending. So we're trying to see that can we resolve that and <coughs> actually still be farmer focused at affordable rates. Affordability is another big issue. At the moment it is 23-24%. We want to bring that down significantly through structuring of the products, through mechanisms of de-risking, including providing market leakages and other things. That's an objective that we... So in both these uh, investments that we made and the subsequent investments that we will make, uh, you know, some of the investors ask us, where is the tech in this? You know, I don't know. I, I don't need to even have tech. So we, we are not somebody who's obsessed with the word tech or the need for tech. Is it making a significant impact to community at large is a question we see and that's going to be the core of it. We want promoters who spend large amount of time on the ground. So we want a promoter who spends 20 days traveling in the field himself is a hands-on promoter. And we want guys who are long-term players so who are deeply into it who are going to be around for four to five to six years not playing the valuation game and the exit game so these are the philosophies so we're building institutions for the country rather than trying to uh, return uh, higher returns for our investors and if you see the investors who into our fund also they're mostly professionals from agribusiness and others who wipe with the philosophy that we hold as an institution and I think that's where we are. Great, uh, Menon, very heartening to see your thesis, uh, very farmer focused. And I agree before we talk about green and agri-tech finance, it's, it's institutional finance <coughs> farmer. Uh, I think that itself is a challenge. And if someone is willing to pay for 24% as an interest rate, you know, just imagine <coughs> The impact it can create if we can break that cost to 10% or 8%, uh, it could be phenomenal. So I think we have taken a lot of time. I'm sure there'll be some questions among the audience. So we can open it up if uh, anyone has a question. Yeah, if you can be, if you can introduce yourself and if you can be very brief so that everyone gets a chance. Uh, 
Uh, uh, good afternoon. My name is Mari Appan. I am the president of the Tamil Nadu Small and Tiny Industries Apex Body Association the, in the Tamil Nadu. And also I am the managing director of Steel Cluster Services Project Limited. This is a scheme of government of uh, India MSME Ministry. The, we have set up a cluster unit at a project cost of 20 crores. We are manufacturing agricultural implements and uh, many products, steel products. I would like to know, are you interested in giving francis for the technology, design and also for manufacturing so that in the South India, we can able to uh, produce the implements at uh, economic cost, number one. Number two, you are telling that the interest rate is around 23, 24 percent. Definitely, it is not affordable to the farmers and uh, any export oriented projects you are uh, guiding. Exim Bank is uh, funding at 2 to 3 percent interest. They are giving nearly 80 percent like that also. Is there any chance to combine the Exim Bank uh, uh, schemes with the uh, agro based industries? So I don't know whether we can answer the Exim Bank question, but uh, investments into plant and machinery. No, no, we, I, I need the technology and. Uh, technology. Technology and. Uh, so I think uh, if we are talking of uh, Balwan, 90% uh, is outsourced from China. And both in terms of the quality of products that they have and the price points at which they can sell to us, it's very difficult for an Indian manufacturer to match those. We are slowly uh, developing some indigenous uh, production base for sprayers and other uh, equipment which has less of uh, steel and things like that, plastic uh, molds. So we're trying to indigenize, but price competitiveness is not there. So uh, we do not own any technologies. <laughs> so if we have to say that any machinery has been invented, uh, we have not invented any. We are more a marketplace for agricultural implements. Right. Right. Any more questions? Let's give <coughs> others a chance. Any more questions? Yeah, so on uh, cost of funds, let me tell you, and Anil was referring to that, uh, the, there are three elements to cost. The cost at which we raise funds, the operating cost of delivering credit and recovering credit, the risk involved in the loan portfolio. So if our cost of funds itself is close to 12%, the OPEX in doing retail lending is around 8 to 10%. So that itself is 20 plus. Add to that a risk cost. And then you have the answer about why it is. So if you bring down the cost of funds to 5 to 6%, uh, if we work with Federal Bank, is one bank which we are partnering with, we are helping it down to 15 percent. These are all theories which will work, but <coughs> need to be working on. The possibilities on, in theory, it's like, you know, many of the bank loan products are like the suit in the showcase. You know, many of these schemes of the government also, are actually non-functional on the ground. So we need to get those going. If you can bring down the cost of credit, the OPEX we will manage to lower through mechanisms. We believe the risk cost in credit is low. It's exaggerated that agriculture is very risky. We will structure products. You know, the farmer needs loans at certain periods of time. We will structure products accordingly. Not that KCC, teen saal ke baad, <coughs> bullet repayment and then the farmer is never uh, having interaction with the banker. The banker doesn't know what's happening. So we will formulate credit products which are appropriate. And as uh, Anil said, you know, your rotation of capital is equally important. If you borrow money at 18%, rotate it in two months, three times, your actual returns are, you can earn a return on equity of 100%. On the 10% of equity that you have, you can double that 
after paying a loan at 20 percent also so you need to understand if you have the capacity to absorb and deploy and rotate funds uh, then you take it and we are very conscious we will not lend to unlendable entities and we will not just because there's a guarantee of somebody in napkisan or sfac at the back we will not lend to unbankable farmers shrut third uh, Hyderabad. Sharath, can you throw some light on cost of funds for Ninja card, especially for trade finance? So I think the uh, uh, minister said it right. That's exactly how it works, right? And uh, uh, we are in talks with a few banks. Uh, and uh, so basically, uh, when so two things, right? Uh, the uh, For banks operate if the portfolio is larger. Mm, and, and then that's when the interest comes in. So right now we are working with NBFC uh, partners who are to deploy the funds. But uh, now we have a sizable portfolio built across uh, these legs, right? We are seeing uh, some interest with uh, two, three national banks. And if they come in, uh, I think uh, stringency also come in, right? Because NBFC also in different way than the banks come in and, and those operational procedures have to be taken. As rightly put, sir, we also believe in uh, building uh, for the right product and that's the whole point of removing the bad players because uh, you know, the industry should not get affected because there are few bad guys, right? So it's, it's also identifying the right people and uh, incentivizing the right uh, behavior and that's when uh, this will work. Uh, and, and definitely uh, without banks and uh, formal funds, uh, uh, it, 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 it's, it's higher now. But with Banks also starting looking at in, in a different light right now. I see uh, we will be able to bring down those costs, but definitely execution uh, matters a lot here. Uh, Vijay, you, have you seen any interesting innovation on financing side from the uh, very few actually, uh, hardly less than five out of 2,500, and each of them has been actually the struggle is the innovation is there, but they've been either, either trying to be on the banking side or on the insurance side, and the most of them in the agri fintech side they struggle to align with the banks. Because it's, uh, banks are in turn regulated by you know the, the the agencies, so they have the challenge to kind of align with the banks. Because until unless the banks are, it's a kind of B two B business model. Until unless the banks are aligned with the agri fintech company, it's very difficult for the agri fintech companies to operate. Few names are there, but they have been you know a, a, most of it are in the transactional end, trying to you know work on the transactional side of it. But I, I think we had, it's time to wrap, wrap up. We can uh, <laughs> discuss it offline. Uh, so. I've been told we need to wrap up. So thank you, thanks all the panelists for very insightful uh, discussion. Thanks to all the audience for patient listening. Uh, if there are any questions, I think panelists would be available after, after, after the session. So thanks and thanks to the organizers. Thank you very much. Thank you panelists and moderators. Thank you for this valuable dialogue. I request you all to join for a group photograph. We will now proceed to close today's forum with closing remarks that will be delivered by Mr. Gaurav Sushodhya, Vice President in West India. We've had a very enriching uh, session today. I would like to express my gratitude to all the officials, panelists, speakers, and participants for their valuable insights. Some of the key significant observations were made about the key five needs of the farmers, including access to finance, access to infrastructure, access to markets, access to information, and access to technology. Uh, I would like to congratulate ESCAP and Delicap on successful building on the preliminary findings and we are looking forward to launching the complete study. As I conclude, I encourage you all to carry forward the knowledge and insights gained today and we shall all work together to inculcate the inclusive best practices in all of our work that we, that we do towards creating a better ecosystem for farmers. Thank you once again for your presence and commitment to engaging in this constructive investment dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Gaurav. I hope you all were able to submit your evaluation forms.